like to turn it over to our speaker. As you can see, we have Brian Kernigan, who I, I worked for Bell Labs for a while, and I got to know Brian there. And, uh, and he's been involved in all kinds of interesting little languages endeavors. And uh, since he's come here to Princeton University, he's taught some interesting courses, especially for people who are not uh, part of the, the mind meld of um, software people, right? To say, hey, you know, what should we use these computers for? So today he's gonna talk a little bit about eh, millions, billions, zillions. You know, how do we deal with all of these big numbers that bombard us out of the press and, and, and politicians and everything? And what kinds of questions can we ask about the data that we're being given? So, Brian. I should quit while I'm ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Dennis, thank you for the kind introduction. Okay. And let's just see if all of this stuff works. I've discovered that if I move about this fur much further over this way, my eyeballs get fried and then I won't be able to see anybody <laughs> at all. So um, I'll, I'll do that every once in a while and then realize I've made a grievous error. Okay, so um, this is what we're going to uh, be talking about today. Um, an alternate title for the talk might be something like Numeric Self-Defense 101, kind of an introductory course in how to defend yourself uh, in the real world. Uh, but Gen I've been asked this a number of times. Genesis of the book and the talk is a course that I've been teaching uh, here for quite some while, a course for uh, non-technical people about the basics of computing. And one of the things that I've tried to do in that course is to kind of make it interesting by putting in numbers from the real world, and the most interesting numbers are the ones where somebody got it wrong in some way or other. So um, we're gonna do some of that tonight. Now, uh, I would say that for probably 99.99% of the people in this audience, uh, the numbers that we're gonna talk about and the way you think about them, the reasoning and so on, will be absolutely straightforward. You will completely understand it, but I'd just be willing to bet that you have friends and relatives who are not as good as you are at this kind of thing. Uh, and so I hope that you will be able to take some of the lessons uh, and pass them on to those of your friends and relatives who might need them, okay? So that's what we're gonna do. Um, none of it is rocket science. In fact, most of it is, roughly speaking, grade five or grade six arithmetic. So it'll be okay. Everything will be fine. Okay, so. Let's start with an example. This is one that uh, I picked up uh, quite some while ago. It came from Newsweek uh, about, oh geez, 14 years ago it says there. Um, and this is an idea that surfaces from time to time. There is um, in, uh, I wouldn't call them abandoned, but unused salt caverns in the Louisiana uh, Gulf area, a uh, strategic petroleum reserve. It's basically a bunch of petroleum that is there for uh, potential use in case of some kind of natural trouble. And one of the suggestions that's made regularly is, gee, you know, gas prices are too high. Simple economics says that if you put some of this surplus petroleum converted to gasoline on the market, that would drive down prices of gasoline, and so that would be for everybody's benefit. Um, and gas at that time was under $2 a gallon, and of course we're not quite that well off today, so perhaps this would be even a better idea right now. So this was the gist of the story, and there were a couple of factoids. One was the size of the reserve, and the other was how much uh, gasoline a average vehicle uses. Okay, and so the question, this kind of quantitative reasoning question, is how long is that strategic petroleum reserve gonna last? Okay, well, let's think about it. You really need to know two things. How many vehicles? And how big's a barrel? Because this was denominated in barrels. Okay, so how many vehicles are there? Anybody want to guess how many vehicles there are in the United States or make an estimate or something? And then people have already read the book, just be quiet, please. I don't know. <laughs> 300 million. I hear 300 million from somebody. 100 million. 100 million. 300 million. 200. 200, okay. So there's a, there's a range here, and it's actually a pretty plausible range. Uh, okay, so. Uh, if you say one per person, you get 300 million, that's probably a little optimistic. People who, live in big, <laughs> people, people who live in big cities don't need cars. People who live out in the suburbs may have multiple cars, who knows. But, and then the other question, not so obvious, is how big is a barrel? Five feet. <laughs> capacity, ladies and gentlemen. What is the capacity of a barrel? <laughs> I hear numbers. 
I think I heard somebody say 55 gallons. So if you do construction kind of stuff, you're familiar with the 55 gallon stuff. If you ever went to college, you're probably more familiar with this. <laughs> but you know, so I'm going to call it 55 gallons because, as we'll see, that makes the arithmetic easy. Okay, and then later on we'll decide whether 55 is a good enough answer or not, but at least we'll have something that we can work with. Okay? So, do the arithmetic. 550 gallons per year per car, that's 10 barrels per year per car. There are 300 million cars, each using 10. That's 3 billion <coughs> barrels a year. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Uh, the reserve has 660 billion barrels. We're using three of them a year. It's going to last 200 years. Not a bad deal. Why do we worry about oil? <laughs> we could just not gasoline. So you can see, there, and this is the place where uh, you know, more disciplined audience people will wait. But you know, there's a conversion from petroleum to gasoline. Maybe that uses something. Maybe our estimate of vehicles was wrong. Like we didn't include buses and trucks and all those other things. Uh, what else? Uses a feedstock for uh, plastics. Plastic, enormous amount, potentially at least, goes into plastic bottles, right. like, dare I say it, this one. Uh, and so that uses some amount of that petroleum, at least in principle. And you can think of other things, okay? But would any of those make more than, I'd uh, call it a 50% or factor of two difference or something like that, maybe a factor of 10? Probably not. So what's the real answer? <laughs> so what's a factor of a thousand among friends, right? <laughs> kind of doesn't matter very much. So anyway, Newsweek corrected at 660 million barrels, and that means that the Strategic Petroleum Reserve would be gone in two or three months. And that's why this is a real dumb idea. Okay, probably says it isn't going to do a heck of a lot of good during a war either, but uh, that's a separate story. Okay, oh, and one other thing, since people didn't actually know how big a barrel was any more than I did, uh, the New York Times printed a correction a while back that said a barrel is 42 <laughs> gallons, not 42,000. <laughs> that would be one honking big barrel, I must say. <laughs> okay, so you see what's going on here. You have this confusion between million and billion. And this is a fairly frequent kind of um, confusion, as we will see. For example, here are just some random ones from the New York Times over the past you know, six months or something like that, including one that was less than a month ago. Um, confusing billion, billion, and other trillion, billion, and just getting something completely, <laughs> completely wrong. Uh, there. So this is a quite... Wow. A, <laughs> quite a common sort of error in the press of, and other sources as well. And I think the reason is that, and, and you know, this is a pretty technically apt audience. I think for most people, even here, million means big, and billion means really big, <laughs> and trillion means really, really big. And so there's an ordering relationship, but there isn't actually a sense of magnitude, or at least for most people, I think, and I include myself, a meaningful order of magnitude, kind of, you know, real accurate factor of thousand uh, intuition about what those big numbers mean. And so that means it's pretty easy to make mistakes. That's with things that we've been familiar with since we were kids, like million, billion, et cetera. Um, technology, again, something that everybody here is pr pretty familiar with. Um, <clears throat> has added a whole bunch of new words that also relate to powers of a thousand, like kilo omega giga tera peta, and on through, you know, whatever comes next, atta, exa, and yada, and zeta, or is it zeta and yada, I can never remember, and so lots of these things, and that means that the kinds of mistakes that you might make with millions and billions, you're even more likely to make when you talk about words for technology, where not only are the words less familiar, but the things you're talking about are not something you can sort of lay your hands on. I think most people have a sense of what a thousand dollars might be, but what's a kilobyte? Not the same kind of intuition, I think, for most people. So, we have real problems here. We're buried in numbers. Numbers are, they assault us from things like newspapers, magazines, television, and all the things that you see on the internet. There's a huge amount of that kind of stuff. And 
sometimes couched in unfamiliar terms, sometimes very big numbers so that it's hard to grasp them intuitively in any way. Um, and we rely on computers to do our arithmetic for us. I think the kind of facility that we might have had with arithmetic long ago when, for example, a few of you, very few, will remember things like slide rules <laughs> uh, and other computational devices. Yeah, this, this dates us, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> We're losing our ability to do our own arithmetic. We're losing our ability to assess the numbers and the arithmetic that other people are doing for us. Um, and it's, in that sense, it's a real kind of problem. Um, so what I'm trying to do and in... Uh, is, uh, is billion something different in Europe? Ah, uh, yeah. there's a whole yeah. set yeah. of extra uh, confusions, perhaps, because in the United States, billion is 10 to the ninth. In, in other parts of the world, it's actually 10 to the 12th. Well, yeah. And so I am going to be using the, let's call it the North American uh, Western Hemisphere, Northern Western Hemisphere version of 10 to the 9. But that's an absolutely great example of something else, which is potentially another dimension of complexity or confusion. Well, what about trillion? Well, here it's 10 to the 12th, and I don't know what that is in other places. They don't use it. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> You can see that I want to be sort of off in the parochial part of the world. <laughs> I apologize, but it's, it's my part of the world at the moment. Okay, so what I'm trying to do in the talk, uh, in the book, in my course, and so on, is basically sensitize you to the kinds of problems that show up here in dealing with numbers, and then also give you what I hope are some uh, organized techniques for coping with this so that you can do better on the average, okay? So one of the things that you can do is to say, here's this very big number. I don't know what it means, but is there a way that I could bring it down to something that's kind of like scale to me? What is my share of a big number? So here's an example. This is uh, from the Times uh, quite a while ago now when the budget was actually, the deficit was probably uh, a lot less than it is today. It says the, the budget deficit is at $1.3 billion, which is of course a boatload of money. But it's a sufficiently big boatload that I don't think any of us have any real intuition about how big that is. So suppose that that is the deficit, and let's suppose that it applies to roughly a little over 300 million Americans. What's your share of the deficit, or my share of the deficit? Your share is about $4, okay? Dividing 1.3 billion by 300 million, it's about $4 and change. So this seems like actually we could deal with the deficit very, very easily, or <laughs> in 2010, what we would do is let's say, I don't know, pick maybe tomorrow, and we'll just say tomorrow is, let's forego expensive coffee. We won't go to Starbucks <laughs> or, or you know, Starbucks or <coughs> bid or something like that. Instead, we'll spend $4, send it off to Washington, deficit gone, one painless day of sacrifice, a minimal sacrifice. Okay, so we could do it that way, and that would be just fine. But by now, you probably get the idea. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> 1.3 trillion, so there's that factor of a thousand again, and that means that your share of the deficit and my share of the deficit at the time was somewhat over $4,000. And I don't know about you, but there's no way I'm gonna send $4,000 to Washington unless I really have to, okay? And so the deficit remains a problem. And this kind of thing shows up often enough. Here's a parallel example, but parallelism is so great that I could just drop it into the same slide. Um, there was an article a few, uh, not very long ago, which is earlier this year, uh, healthcare, which is an issue to many people, that said uh, it will cost $331 million to give free medical care to everybody in California, presumably for a year, uh, and that sounds like a really good deal. Okay, yeah, right, somebody can do the arithmetic, I can do it. It's sort of 10 bucks a person. Now, I can assure you that if healthcare cost 10 bucks a person, we would not be discussing Obama. <laughs> it would not be a political hot button issue the way it is. And so by now, you know, the template is exact. It was 331 billion, et cetera. Now that's under the assumption that the population of California is 33 million. It's at more like 40 million. So this is $8 instead of, you know, who cares? So you can see that what I've done here is to take a big number that is not easy to grasp, bring it down to my size, how much, what's my share of that? And to do that, all I need to do is to be able to divide, in this case, by 300 million, okay? And since we're starting with billions, you get numbers that are actually pretty manageable. I'll give you one that came up, in fact, in, I think 
literally yesterday that I was reading something about the uh, United States military budget. How much is the government proposing to spend in 2019 on the United States military? The answer is 680 billion. You can do the arithmetic. Your share is $2,000. Is that money being well spent or not well spent? I don't know, I leave it to you, but that's the same way you could reason about that. That's your share of basically financing the military. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Big numbers, bring them down to size by making them personal to you. Um, another thing that you can do, given a number, is just look at it and say, geez, you know, that sounds like it's way too big. Maybe it's way too small. Yeah, it could be in that Goldilocks position in the middle where it's just about right. So here's one. This is, uh, I see enough gray right here in the audience here that people will remember what that device is down there. Most of the younger generation will not remember uh, what these things were. But you know, okay. And so there, there was this story in the Star Ledger a decade ago at this point when these were ubiquitous, and in fact, flat panel didn't really exist, observing that if you turned this thing off at night, you would save $88 a day. <laughs> so, thinking about that, the implications, if, if it cost you $88 a day for a computer, how many of us would have computers? <laughs> Zero, we would not be in the field we're in at this point. So this is clearly wrong. Um, it's an example, I think, of getting the, the um, units wrong. A few days later, the Star Ledger published a correction that said, oh, we meant $88 a year. <laughs> so it's not a factor of 1,000, it's a factor of 365, but it's the same idea, something is way too big, or uh, in this case. So getting the units wrong is as much of a problem sometimes as getting just a billion trillion thing wrong. In both cases, they can give you something that's off by a substantial fraction. Okay, so what we did to this was sort of reason backwards. If it cost $88 a day to run a computer, we wouldn't have computers. We do have computers, therefore something is wrong. Probably it's the, either the 88 or the per day. And per day is a more likely thing. And so we were able to figure that out. So this idea of reasoning backwards and using your common sense to see whether something is plausible or not, this is an effective way uh, to deal, again, with numbers that you were presented with. Think about what would be the implications if the number were right, and if the implications are nonsensical or seem sketchy, then it's probable that the number is nonsense or sketchy. Okay? Here's a nice example of that. The 747, I understand, has finally been phased out. Boeing isn't making any more of them, but it was a great plane while it lasted, and et cetera. And here they are hurtling down the runway at <laughs> over 2,000 miles an hour. <laughs> So think about the implications again. So there's two obvious implications. Let's pick the simpler one, actually. Um, if these were going at 2,000 miles an hour at takeoff, then from here to pick your favorite place, Los Angeles, London, or something, would be about, what, an hour or an hour and a half? Two hours. It doesn't work that way, does it? No. Uh, so that's clearly wrong. The other thing is you get a bit of trouble from people living near airports about sonic booms uh, as they took off um, and presumably landed somewhere else. So again, completely nonsensical. I think this should have been 200 miles an hour. Pilots in the group can tell me that that's about right for uh, takeoff for a, a, a plane like this. So, okay. Yeah. Implications, reason backwards, get a nutty answer, therefore the, the data that went into it, probably wrong. Okay? All right. So there's another kind of um, number that shows up very, very often in the press. Uh, and it's these sort of milestone numbers where every so often something happens to some population. Okay, so here are two headlines from the New York Times a couple of years apart. One that says 80,000, sorry, 8,000 baby boomers turn 65 every month. And the other one says every day 10,000 baby boomers turn 65. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's right, if either? Well, rather than just saying, geez, I don't know, um, it is actually possible to reason about this. And it, there's actually quite a systematic and even oddly named thing, a way of reasoning about this. And it's something called Little's Law. 
and I had never heard of this until I started poking around and discovered that not only is Little's Law there, but there was a guy named Little who did this, who discovered this or something out of nothing. Um, he was a professor at MIT Sloan School. Um, I don't know whether he's still alive or not, actually. But the basic thing is it's a conservation law that relates flow of stuff. So we have some process. Things go into the process. They spend a while there, and they come out the other end. And there's a relationship between the rate at which they arrive or fall off the other end, how many there are in the process, and how long the process takes. And the way that you can remember it, you see this once, you'll never forget. Think about high school. Okay, You go to high school. Let's say there are 1,000 kids in the high school, and they're going to take four years to get through. That's the process. Four years is the duration. That means every incoming class is 250 people. Every outgoing class is 250 people. Once you've seen that, that's Little's Law. And then you can just plug in different numbers for it. And so it's very, very straightforward and easy. Now, obviously, it doesn't work if people drop out, the population increases, all these other things. But it's close enough for reasoning about things that are flow processes where there's fundamentally a conservation of what's going in and what's coming out. So this is high school. Let's think instead about the process of living. OK? So everybody in this country, let's call it 300 million people or something like that, is going through a process. What's the process? Living. OK? So you're born, you live. And let's simplify life. Let's suppose you live to 75. So you're born, you live to 75, you die. <laughs> OK? This is an oversimplification. But it's not too bad for reasoning. So if everybody lives to 75, that's a service time. And there are, that means that and there are 300 million Americans, then you can divide 75 into 300 million, and you get there are 4 million born every year, 4 million die every year, and in fact, 4 million pass any particular milestone every year. And if 4,000 people pass, sorry, 4 million people pass a milestone every year, then dividing that by about 400, the number of days in a year, then about 10,000 people pass any milestone in a single day. And so, 10,000 people turn 65 every day. 10,000 people die every day. 10,000 people are born. Again, oversimplifies, ignores things like changing birth rates, immigration, immigration, and the fact that people don't live exactly the same length of time. But you can see that it's a pretty decent way to reason about these things. And that means that you can see that the first of those headlines is wrong. And it's another one of these units errors because it said months, and it really should have been days. And the fact that it's 8,000 or 10,000, that doesn't matter. That's in the same general ballpark, close enough. And maybe it should have been 12,000, but it's close enough given all the other simplifications that we're doing. OK? So um, once you've seen that, then you can see a bunch like this. So uh, every day, 10,000 baby boomers turn 50. This is in Gambling Magazine, a magazine that I assure you I don't read. <laughs> I know just enough about numbers to realize that that's a bad move. Oh, OK. Um, 88,500 baby boomers will turn 59 and a half, a magic number in the tax system. That's the same thing. That divide 88,000 by 7, get you down into that 12,000 range again. 350,000 turning 50 every month, divided by 30 days in a month. You're back in the same thing. And then, of course, the 4 million students. So what we have here are four different ways of writing the same thing, and their values are consistent. So that consistency is a good sign as well. It says different ways of computing or, or different expressions of this thing give you essentially the same value. So it's more likely to be right than ones where you get things that are grossly different, where at least one of them is probably wrong. OK? So another thing that is very useful in dealing with numbers is to say somebody gives you a number, like 10,000 Americans are born or die or whatever in a given day. Can you estimate? The that for yourself from what you know, what you can reason about general information. So let's try a, uh, an example. This is an example that works very nicely with kids. There's relatively few of what I would call the real young, young generation here. Uh, this is purportedly a Google interview question. It is not a Google interview question according to anybody I've ever talked to at Google. But, um, but there's a school bus. And the question is, how many of these can you put in it? OK? Now, everybody here will know what to do. This is a cube that is one inch on a side. OK? It's not a round thing. It's a cube. Because that makes the arithmetic easier. Because now, in a foot, cubic foot, you could say there's 12 by 12 by 12. That's about 2,000. How many cubic feet in a bus? Well, you can do your own arithmetic. It's maybe, what, 8 feet wide and 6 feet high and 30 feet. 
you get a number, you come up with a few million uh, golf balls in there. So that's the kind of reasoning that you could do, basically not knowing very much at all, um, except how big is a golf ball, and roughly having a mental picture of the school bus. And then you're going to re replace a part of that. OK, so let's give you one that's more challenging, just to see how you do. Uh, this is one that I asked my class this year. You avoided it. Um, every fall, I go through an ordeal called raking the leaves. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm guessing a number of people here rake the leaves. Yeah. Uh, and so the question is, here's a, a random tree. Uh, how many leaves are on it? This comes from the question, I'm sitting there, I'm raking for hours, and there's nothing to do except rake. <laughs> so, can I do mental arithmetic to try and pass the time? How many censored leaves did I rake this year? And therefore, you know, I can count the trees, that's easy, how many leaves on a tree? Okay? So do we want to have an estimate here? Audience response, how many leaves are on a tree like this? One million. Yeah. One million. I hear a million. I hear 100,000. 50,000. 20,000. 50,000. Yeah. Season. Season. You can see lots of different things. It turns out that you can actually reason about this too. I'm not going to do the arithmetic. But it, look, a tree is just a, you know, it's a cube or a column or something that's this by this by this. And roughly speaking, it's a surface covered with leaves because the leaves have to be exposed to the sun or they can't make whatever they make, you know, chlorophyll or something like that. Um, and so, Compute the surface area. How big's a leaf? Well, that depends on the tree, but you know it's roughly this big. You can do the arithmetic, and you come up with numbers that are in the range. So I ask my class this exercise off and on. I ask it this year, and here's the results, uh, just plotted as a graph. How many leaves are there on the tree? And this looks suspiciously like of the 40 people who answered this, only one person actually did answer it. Right? Uh, it's like what the heck? Yeah, exactly. And so, <laughs> well, the answer is down here in the corner. It's hard to read, but there was one person in the class who said, there are 10 billion leaves on a tree. <laughs> and so this is the outlier. And all the other data is faithfully plotted down here, <laughs> but it's too small to see. <laughs> so this is a statistical observation. You have lots of data, but if there's going to be outliers, they can really, really, really badly skew what you're doing with the rest of the data. So if you remove that, then you get something that's sort of <laughs> sensible. And in fact, they're, they're, the answers you see are in the range that mostly people were talking about. You know, here's 200,000, here's 150, there's 100,000. And down at this point, we're in the range of, are we talking about honey locusts or big maples, right? Doesn't matter. So this is the, sen the distribution from the class, and it's actually pretty darn sensible, OK? On average, there are some people who are a little too small down there. And there's one other thing, and again, it's hard to see. The numbers down on the left are the actual data values that go into this graph, and I want to circle one of them. It's hard to see, <laughs> but it says 188496. <laughs> so this is something else about numeracy, or whatever it is you've got to be aware of, which is that there are things you cannot know that precisely. <laughs> you cannot know down to the exact number how many leaves are on a general tree. Uh, it's perhaps you could count them on a real tree, but this is something which I worked on my students, and most of them have the idea. Most of those numbers are perfectly round, but there are occasional exceptions like this. Okay, so that's a, a special lesson: be wary of excessive precision. Okay. So here's an estimation question for you guys. I will not ask you to answer it in real time, but you can think about it if you find yourself dozing off during the rest of the talk, okay? <laughs> You've seen the new parking meters that were in, a, in Princeton. Yay. These things here that up close look like this. You've, everybody has seen these. Some of them, you may have had to use them. These, this was photographed downtown somewhere. This was on uh, Prospect. You've probably seen them. You've probably used them, okay? So I set two questions for the students in my class how much do those things bring in per day? Just one of these guys, how much money does get put into that one way or another in a day over a period of time, let's say over a week? Um, and the other is how much do these things cost? Because that will tell you how soon they will pay for themselves. So I'm not going to give it away. I was pleased with many of my students, though not all. And um, 
you think about it too. This is an example of something where you can observe every single piece of what's going on here and make a sensible estimate. It will not be right, right, whatever that might mean, but I'll bet you get pretty decently close. So you can just think about that and maybe we can talk about it after or something like that. All right? So with that in mind, I mean, I've got a couple other things to watch out for. Um, I mentioned these oddly precise numbers. They show up in a variety of contexts, not just students putting in more uh, data or more digits than are called for. Um, so several of these kinds of things. But let me give you an interesting example thereof. Here's another uh, quotation. This comes from something called the Yacht Report, which I can assure you again, I do not read the Yacht Report. Uh, When a yacht is over 328 feet long, you'd lose the intimacy. And you can just imagine somebody, not me, saying, you know, I used to have a yacht that was 326 feet long, and it was great. You know, I'd go on a cruise, and I knew everybody on the boat. It was just no problem. And then I got this new one, which is 330 feet long, and, ah, oh, jeez, I never know. I don't know who's on the thing. It's too <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> I think that someone wrote in a different, you know, in, in, I mean, one possibility is someone wrote in metric and then it got turned into feet. Oh, yes, 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 yes. First prize to the gentleman there. Yeah, yeah. this is exactly it. And again, this is a, an example of a, an error you will see all over the place where things have been expressed in, let's say, the metric system and then blindly converted with a, a you know, some kind of computer program into the local equivalent in, let's say, the English units used here without actually realizing what's going on. So this is something that started as, oh yeah, the boat's about 100 meters, right? And that got translated blindly by someone in a journalistic profession, let's say, into 328 feet. Once you've seen 328, we'll now start to see 328s and multiples of it all over the place. <laughs> look at and say, wait a minute, oh, yeah, yeah, 656, that's 200 meters. <laughs> or another one, how many times have you heard stories of a drug bust where they found 22 pounds of heroin? <laughs> Where's 22? 10 kilos, monsieur, right? So you will see that kind of thing. So watch out for these. This is one of the sources of specious precision. I'm sure it goes in the other direction, but at least locally, there's an awful lot of people importing metric numbers and converting them blindly. Okay. So I want to talk about a couple of things that come from an absolutely wonderful book um, that I suspect many of you are familiar with, this book called How to Line with Statistics. This is a great book. This is an absolutely fabulous book. Uh, it was uh, written and published in 1954, I think. It's still very much in print. I bought probably half a dozen or more copies over my lifetime, and I suggest you do likewise. Yeah, Absolutely great, great book. Um, modern, uh, Daryl Huff, the author, uh, inveighed against a bunch of statistical, very simple-minded statistical chicanery in this book. Um, and I'm going to play just a couple of those things. And then I think modern technology has made it possible to do things that would have been hard in Huff's time. We can do them much better with that same goal of misleading people or giving the wrong impression in some way or other. So let's look at a couple of modern examples of things that are actually also in Huff's book. One of them is something called a G-Wiz graph. It's kind of neat. You can see this guy, he, it's, it's baseball, I think. Um, and he's obviously really, really unhappy. And the reason he's unhappy is that his fastball is half the speed it was last year. <laughs> Sorry, it's his knuckleball, that might explain it. Um, Except if you look at it carefully, you say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's the zero on those values? Well, it's down in the basement somewhere. Because the one on the left is 77, and the one on the right is 75. And that's sort of a two or a bit percent difference. So attempting to make the graph interesting, or not take up too much space, or whatever, it's thrown away significant visual impact, giving you the wrong message by throwing away a lot of the data from zero up to something. And so it's called a G-Wiz graph because it basically is a, wow, it inflates uh, the change in the data from one place to another. And there are lots of these. Let me give you another one, which is probably, many of you will remember this. Uh, remember the flash crash in the stock market uh, in 2010? I gave a talk at a, a place that does trading, and they knew down to the minute when this 
happened. <laughs> you guys have probably forgotten as I have. But here's the flash crash that Dow Jones is going along, and all of a sudden, wham, the bottom drops out of the market, and all the people think, oh, my retirement's going forever. I'll have to work the rest of my life. Um, except if you look at it very carefully, it went from a little over 10,800 or something like that down to 9,800. Okay? So again, the zero is down in the sub basement this time. <laughs> if we plot it differently, that's what it looks like. Now, this is still scary, especially if you're in that business or if you're in it for the short term, but you can see that that was not a big deal, other than for a very short period of time, and even then, not a big deal, just a potential problem. So those are nice examples of GWIS graphs. Okay. Another one that Huff liked, and which you can still find very modern examples, um, is something he called the one-dimensional graph. So this is an example of a one-dimensional graph that comes from a paper that I actually respect a great deal, the New York Times. I suspect many of you read it. This comes from the Times Magazine very recently. And it's the eternal question, how old should someone be when they get their first cell phone? Okay, and you can see two years old, 0.2%. Okay, four, 0.4. You know, and so it goes on, and like that. Um, <clears throat> that's the survey. Look at it carefully. I'm going to blow it up a bit so you can see it. See the green part, 13%, that little green part over on the left? Yeah, 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 yeah. See the 14%, which is essentially the same as 13%? See it's like, like this? So what is happening here is you take a linear measure, which is the percentage or something like that, and you display it with something that's proportional to the area. And so this is a, an arc of a circle. You could imagine a whole circle it would have the same visual effect or the same misrepresentation of the data, because what you're doing is squaring the data in a way that makes no sense whatsoever. So the New York Times, this uh, thing of Dear Reader, et cetera, has showed up in the magazine. It started in, I think, the late summer, and it's still going. They're producing a new one every week or two, and many of them are just a triumph of really, really bad uh, graphics, <laughs> a triumph of sort of form over function. Um, I will show you one more. I have, I have a whole bunch of them, but I'm only going to impose on you with one of them, which is this one. This is, is the what's your number number uh, kind of question. Uh, how much do you need to be considered rich? And can you make sense of, <laughs> of why, what this is meant to do? All the money bags are exactly the same size. <laughs> So I, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, so, so this is a, there's a kind of a, I'm not going to say it. Anyway, I have no idea what they're trying to do with this one. It's just kind of pointless. But you notice that this was uh, only less than a month ago or something, about a month ago. They're still doing it. Um, so we saw it back here, this one. This was the area misrepresentation, basically squaring the data and therefore giving up the wrong idea. Um. <laughs> How about this one? <laughs> this is produced by some small educational institution in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, observing that back in 2000, Summer stipends for graduate students were half a million dollars, and the next year they went up to $2 million, which is a factor of four. But we will, for graphical impact, use a tiger whose volume is four cubed or 64 times as big. And so the, you know, the misleading impression is even greater than it would have been before. Okay? So who knows? Um, and then this is what I found recently, and this is for the real computer, you know, IT professionals in the group. Maybe you can explain this one. Uh, <coughs> containers. If you don't know what a container is in the computer sense, you're, I'll, you know, I'm in the same club. I don't read Rocket either. I do not think that this is going to help me understand. <laughs> so I'll just leave that for a moment while we think about it. Uh, okay. So these are <laughs> form over function. Somebody's being paid to produce pretty pictures, and the message, the actual content of it, disappears in the prettiness in some way, uh, assuming this is pretty. OK. Um, and then sometimes you get things that are actual misrepresentation of stuff. This comes from a news network which is known for such things sometimes, um, but I won't name them. Um, 
So this the unemployment rate, this is quite an old picture, 2011 under President Obama at the time, um, and you can see that the employment rate is kind of not really getting better, it's kind of steady at best, except, this says 9.0, you go directly horizontally to 8.6. So this has just got to be intentional. It just doesn't make any sense. Okay. So you have to be a little careful of who's giving you the stuff, just to make sure that they're actually giving you something that's accurate, um, and that they're not trying to mislead you in a way. Here's another one that's kind of cute. Um, this is gun deaths in Florida. Florida has this uh, famous or infamous stand your ground law, uh, which has been used to justify for a number of unpleasantnesses. Um, but as you can see, when the stand your ground law went into effect, gun deaths dropped, right? Except the graph goes down, not up. So if we turn it upside down, we get something rather different. So again, somebody is trying to tell you something, and I don't know whether that is just for graphical effect or whether there is an actual conscious attempt to mislead people about what's going on. Okay. Um, and just one last thing for, I don't know, let's call it practice or something like that, um, while we're speaking of guns. This is statistic of show <laughs> as fast with the powers of two. One lonely child, unfortunate person in, two, in 1950 is killed. Next year it's two, then it's four, and so on. In 1960, we've got a thousand of them. In 1970, we have a million. In 1980, we have a billion. In 1990, we have a trillion. And we're not there yet. So, Learning in fear. Yeah. So I think what happened here is another example of if somebody said that this was doubled every decade, you could almost believe that that was right. Okay. So I'm guessing that's what went on. Uh, this is quoted actually in a very good book called A Damned Lies in Statistics, which was written by Joel Best, who's a sociologist at the uh, University of Delaware, I believe. Um, and he cites it as the worst social science statistic ever published. <laughs> I don't know the discipline very well, so I can't comment on that, but it does seem rather poor. So anyway, what have we learned at this point? I don't know. Perhaps some advice um, of things you might look for, of uh, you know, recognizing things that might have gone wrong. And sometimes they're flaky numbers or excessive precision. And sometimes we've seen lots of examples of, of wrong units. And uh, wrong arithmetic is common as well. This sort of who's telling you this stuff, I think, is a very, very important thing. Because there are an awful lot of folks around who have access to grind, who are trying to steer our beliefs, our positions, and so on in particular directions. And it requires kind of eternal vigilance to keep up with that sort of thing. I think the more that you actually know, the more likely you'll be able to defend yourself against these kinds of things, primarily by making your own estimates or checking what somebody says against your own lived experience, your common sense, and your ability to do simple arithmetic as well. And really, the common sense part is probably the most important. So um, there is lots of good reading. I mentioned. Daryl Huff, of course, and I mentioned Joel Best. He has several other books along that uh, style as well, all of which are uh, fun, interesting reading. John Allen Pauls uh, coined, didn't coin the word enumeracy, but wrote a book about it with that title 30 years ago, which is still quite good reading. Um, and while we're happening, he's at Temple, and the mathematician reads the newspaper, has that same flavor, and then Proofiness is a nice book as well. So, so that's sort of the essence of this. What I would like you guys to do is to now go think about this um, talk to your friends and relatives who have not as got as much experience or fluency with numbers and reasoning as you have. Um, see if you can move them along as well. And of course, if you come across good examples, for heaven's sake, send them to me so I can write a second edition or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I would really be very happy. And in the interval, um, thanks to our good friends at Labyrinth, you can actually get the book.